Lana, I was going to ask if you wanted to record. Okay, there we go, perfect. Um, so yes, thank you again, uh, Oksana and uh, Svetlana for your very warm welcome uh, and, and for inviting me uh, today uh, to the session. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to reflect a lot since the, so many questions came through. So thank you as well for to everyone that sent the, the questions through. Uh, I'm just about to share my screen. And uh, whilst I do that, I have to say sunny greetings from the UK. Um, I was saying to Svetlana and Oksana, being British, we have to speak about the weather. So we now have our three days of summer because that's about as long as the sun may last. So I'm just going to. Yeah, okay. we see. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. OK, great. Um, so I, I know we have people from from uh, many, many different parts of the world, and it's it, it's actually an honor to to revisit as well Ukraine, even though it's virtually as part of today's session. Uh, I was fortunate um, to be in, in Kiev a couple of times uh, in the last few years, uh, and today, of course, speaking with the wider group as well. Uh, and of course, the, the, the big thank you to Sitlana uh, and Oksana from a soft serve pers perspective, where Konica Minolta and soft serve have been working together for the last 10 years. Actually, I, I discovered through some research around the, the management print uh, solutions. Um, but for today, I, I'd like to walk you through and share some insights around um, Konica Minolta. Uh, the way we approach innovation, the, the thinking of uh, a very you know, traditional Japanese company that's going through a huge transformation and uh, evolution as well. And so before we get into the, the core details, I'd like for you to please look at this cube for only about 20 to 30 seconds and let me know if anything happens. So that's a super fast 15 to 20 seconds. And uh, for, for those that are on the call, if you, if you want to write something in chat, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but this I, I like a lot as a very brief exercise. When we think about boxed thinking or thinking outside the box, the, the exercise called the Neko cube. when I'm looking at this box, I see that the, the main uh, front of the box is on the bottom left. And the moment I start looking at it for 10 to 15 seconds, it shifts completely to the right hand side. And so when it comes to innovation, you know, we, we start thinking about when we see a problem to be solved, there might be some answers that come to you straight away. But actually, if you spend some more time, you start seeing things from different perspectives. And that then becomes even more powerful when we work as a team with different types of personas that help us view the same problem to be solved in many different ways as well. And so Konica Minolta, uh, we, we have a, a slogan of giving shape to ideas. Uh, the company itself, um, many of you may have heard of the company and perhaps know us as being a camera company. Or all I, I, I hear of, often as well is um, a print company. But in reality, we sold the camera business, the core camera business, many, many years ago. Uh, and we do a lot, lot more. So the core business is around the digital workplace as a business. Uh, we have professional print uh, business as well. Uh, there is a, a growing healthcare focus and industry as well. So industrial solutions such as, for example, uh, color measurement, uh, light measurement devices, and especially focused on sensing. And uh, the sensing division I'm learning more about is, is a fascinating area where, for example, you might uh, look at area, uh, colors of uh, differences in, for example, fruits. Uh, what might what shape they might be and using hyperspectral cameras to differentiate not just the color but the depth uh, the the, uh, the freshness of the fruits and so on so we have a multitude of different uh, businesses within the Konica Minolta group as well as a planetarium business uh, so the fact fun fact of the day is that um, Konica Minolta is one of the only companies in the world that is fully qualified to build large-scale planetariums uh, I was lucky to visit um, Japan a, a few years back and to visit also one of our planetariums. It was a fascinating uh, experience. So the core technologies for Konica Minolta, uh, when we founded the company in 1873, uh, are around materials, optics, nanofabrication, and uh, imaging. And the way the, the strategy works at Konica Minolta from a, from a corporate perspective is that we work in three-year cycles of, uh, of planning. And uh, the, the new vision that was uh, 
publicly announced in December last year is called imaging to the people. Because when we understand our, our DNA, it is really imaging centric. So our brand position is giving shape to ideas and our vision is the, the imaging to the people with a philosophy of creation of new value, hence the topic of today as well. So imaging to the people, uh, there's, there is a very strong emphasis from a Japan perspective and, and, and rolled out globally in the way that we approach uh, solutions, in the way that we work with clients, and, and to really emphasize that we need to think about becoming vital to society. How can we work together uh, internally or with partners, with startups, with academia, to bring vision into reality? So it's essential that everything that we work on as, as innovations and incubations are contributing towards the sustainable growth of society and individuals. And in order for us to do that, we have to realize two things. Uh, the first point is purpose. You know, why do we work where we work? Or why do we do what we do? So if we strive for a purpose, we automatically end up solving potential issues and problems that create uh, a, uh, that lead to creating a sustainable society. Then we have this wonderful topic of uh, innovation. Uh, and of course, innovation has many different definitions. Uh, my experience is that ultimately, no one really cares how innovative we are. What really matters in an in a innovation hierarchy of need is how our innovation ultimately helps the customer's customer and to serve them better. So that could be product enhancements, that could be customer experience, uh, but really to ensure that we're thinking about the customer's customer as part of this uh, innovation journey. This image is very interesting, which I'll show you in a second. So some definitions of innovation here, we think about innovation as successful like exploitation of new ideas, uh, potentially translation of ideas into or inventions into something that customers will pay for. And that's really critical as well. <clears throat> Innovation can be a creation, it can be uh, a development of a new product or services that helps companies gain a competitive advantage. And finally, uh, another view that I like as well as a, a new idea, even the thought process of creativity uh, or new ways of imagining things in terms of a, a device or a method. So the image that you saw uh, earlier on, is a, it's part of a trivia. Many of you may not recognize the, the gentleman and his family, of course, uh, but this was the first official photo that was taken with a selfie stick. Uh, and what's really interesting is that the invention came from Mr. Uida, uh, who was a, a, a Minolta engineer and who filed a patent back in 1983. And what's really interesting is why did he do this and what was the creation and an idea behind it? So Uida son and his family were visiting Europe and he felt that uh, you know, uh, from a politeness point of view as well, from a safety point of view, he had the camera. Uh, but of course, in terms of taking photos, he would have to keep on asking other people. So he invented the idea of having a stick that attaches to a camera and that enables for, for selfies. But that was 1983. The key lesson was that although the patent was filed, it lasts for 10 years. And someone somewhere else in the US, many years later, invented the same solution when the trend was far, far more uh, exponential. So, so the key lesson here is there's invention, there's innovation, and there's also having amazing solutions that might just be too early to take to market, even though they solve a problem uh, as well. Um, so this is Mr. Yamana, our CEO and president. Uh, and in, a, in an article in the Sunday Times uh, a few years back, he was uh, interviewed. And, and I like this reflection. He said, we cannot live with past success. Unless we become a positive disruptor, we will be disrupted. But what does that mean? And where does innovation come from? So we think of the history of Konica Minolta and the merger of Konica and Minolta into one company started in 2003. But actually, when I joined in 2014, the company has already been innovative throughout its history. So it wasn't to say that just because an innovation team, a business innovation team has, has been focused and established, that now we will have 
even more innovations that are that have never been done before, but also that we suddenly become an innovative company. So the history of Konica Minolta, for example, releasing the world's first 35 millimeter camera with a built-in flash, it now so sounds really trivial, but that was back in 1975, for example. The reason I joined the company in 2014 was to support the, the founding and launch of the Business Innovation Center in Europe, where I'm based here in London, and to, to scale up uh, with a focus of two things. So there are four business innovation centers globally. Uh, we have one in Europe where I'm located and the European locations include Brno in Czech Republic, uh, London where I'm based, Munich in Germany, Sofia and in Vienna. And then we have three other uh, business innovation centers as well. The objective are two, objectives are twofold. Um, the first one is to develop new products, uh, digital solutions and, uh, and work closely to the market and customers, which is essential to be really customer driven. And the second part is, which I like a lot, uh, of, which is often also overlooked, is uh, transformation from a cultural perspective. So what does it take for a company to go through this digital transformation from an innovative point of view and a cultural transformation perspective as well? And the way we work is uh, the, the uniqueness about how we frame our ideas is uh, on the left-hand side you see at the top to work closely with the, in the heart of the market. So working with customers to innovate and solve problems in their business. Of course, there is also internal transformation. We have an open innovation approach, meaning that we, we work uh, where possible with startups, uh, venture capitalists, uh, academia, uh, government, etc. We have a very strong portfolio of new ideas. Uh, but of course, you know, the, the, the community here today, if, from an innovation point of view, we can have lots and lots of ideas but it's extremely tough to go through a systematic approach to validate those ideas. And of course, we cannot work on every idea that we have. So we have a, a strategic portfolio approach, uh, meaning that we look at emerging uh, solutions, we look at next generation, and then maybe we might say more moonshots. And another part uh, of the methodology and framework is called a, a 3S value model, which means that every idea we think about should consider what is the social value that we want to bring to our customers or society? What makes the idea sustainable uh, from a, a uniqueness point of view? And why should we care in terms of a business outcome? Meaning what is the potential for it to be, to be scaled? So just to take a deeper dive uh, for a few minutes around the development of the new products and services. Uh, so we are very well into this fourth industrial revolution where technology is exponentially growing. Uh, many of us have faced a lot of challenges in the last year, especially. And the human adaptab uh, adaptability is still catching up. So it's, it's that technology can be outpacing and yet we want to make sure that we are human centric. So what does that mean from an innovation point of view? So we can have a, a defined strategy. And as we develop the strategy to, to seek new ideas and new innovation opportunities, I often refer to this S-curve. And the S-curve is an evolution potentially of an idea. So we might say, for example, that um, Konica Minolta was a camera company. But if you strip everything away from the camera, the physical product, you're left with optics and imaging. People know us as a print company. But if you strip everything away from the hard, uh, hardware, we're left with optics and imaging. So the S curve then evolves, how could we bring print to life? For example, through augmented reality. And so we start thinking about the S curve uh, opportunity that creates new innovations. I apologize for this slightly academic slide here, uh, but I, I like this slide a lot because it, it introduces the idea of uh, an organiza organizational ambidexterity. Uh, ambidexterous, uh, ambidexterous people are those that can write with their left hand and with their right hand. And this here speaks about uh, exploration on the one hand, meaning exploration of new ideas and exploitation of different parts of the company. So when we look at Konica Minolta, there are lots and lots of different elements and solutions that could serve our clients from a value proposition as well as exploration of new ideas. They then merge together in terms of the innovation life cycle and ecosystem, as well as the operational life cycle as well. Then we have this huge topic of digital transformation. 
And uh, that the way that we approach this is by thinking about digital and in brackets is business transformation. Uh, and to me, my personal view is when we look at level one at the bottom, incremental innovation should be happening everywhere. Uh, incrementally uh, and digitalization of, of existing processes should be the norm. It becomes interesting when we truly think about transformation, transformation through development of new business models and ultimately disruption. And this is, this is really this, um, this term of metamorphosis. So if you imagine a caterpillar, a caterpillar when it's incrementally innovating, it is only walking fast. But when it truly tr disrupts and transforms itself, only then it realizes that that caterpillar can turn into this beautiful butterfly. So from a Konica and Minolta point of view, and even other co corporations, thinking about digital transformation from an internal perspective and an external perspective is essential. And what we've seen, especially reflecting on the last year, is this, uh, this necessity becomes the mother of all invention. And through this new normal, we have a, a new type of a customer and we've been enforced to learn new behaviors. Uh, so for example, my life totally changed uh, overnight. Uh, I was on the road every week to various countries uh, across Europe and that came to a stop. So I had to adapt in a very different way. We didn't know which direction necessarily at the beginning we should go into. Uh, and this is similar to other companies, but there is also an opportunity. So out of a crisis, there is an opportunity to either pivot and be hopeful of a new way forward. So communication and collaboration has become even more essential in our virtual world. There was a question uh, that I was asked to address in terms of the, the process of innovation that we follow. <clears throat> so traditional manufacturing organizations tend to use this uh, stage gate approach, which you see at the bottom, which is very briefly to walk through a business idea and very, very high level as the business idea. And systematically you follow the process <clears throat> for feasibility study, to design a concept for the business itself, to validate with customers a prototype to think about customer validation, customer interviews, and then ultimately at stage four, the commercialization phase. It can take long between one year to two years to three years before <clears throat> you're able to fully scale a business. <coughs> Excuse me. On the top left, you see this, uh, this funnel where lots and lots of ideas are going into the funnel uh, and the funnel has many different holes. And of course the holes mean that a lot of times ideas get thrown in and by default at various stages, they fall out just because they don't meet certain objectives. They don't prove the value uh, proposition. The KPIs are, are, are not specific enough or that the KPIs are not met. So the process of from going to from uh, ideation all the way through to market launch is following an agile approach towards the stage gate process. And so in the next five minutes, I would just like to conclude the presentation part around the, the Business Innovation Center Europe key domains. And so I mentioned that we have a, a portfolio approach. Uh, so the first portfolio elements are around augmented vision. The second is what we call as being assisted and connected reality. <clears throat> and then we have a bunch of new incubations. Uh, for example, we, we're exploring the area of robotics uh, as, a, as one of the newer areas of, of exploration. So the first uh, solution here is uh, augmented reality, uh, a solution called Generate. Um, in short, Generate is bringing print to life. And what we've developed is this, this way of um, the S-curve that, that you saw earlier on. How can we think around bringing print to life so that it's in motion? And as a, as a team, uh, the development has, uh, has various assets and facets. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a very sophisticated studio which is a low code, no code solution, meaning that anyone can register to generate as a, on the platform. And within two to three minutes are able to create their first augmented reality experience. So it's very much what you see is what you get. On the left-hand side, we have our own application uh, or it can be custom branded. And of course, many, many companies have their own uh, applications already, in which case we've created a, a, a software development kit for integration of Generate into an existing, uh, existing application. Why and uh, for what reason is this creating uh, customer value? So rather than going through every single one, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you can refer to this uh, afterwards, but two key points here 
it enables a, a greater level of engagement in terms of potential increase in customer conversion and building a reputation for from uh, advisory to to much more uh, a, a trusted advisor. Uh, of course, from a business from a business point of view, there is an opportunity to create uh, potentially new revenue streams. The second solution, uh, and this was born out of primarily, uh, or the scaling of this solution was primarily from uh, the result of the pandemic. So AeryLink stands for Assisted Industrial Reality. It's a, a peer to peer remote audiovisual guidance solution. And pictorially, you can see here, so the, there's a call center operator on the left hand side who might be an, uh, an experienced engineer. And on the right hand side, it could either be a, a machine operator, junior worker. And in the last year, we've seen our clients actually be invited to an Airy Link session so that our engineers can see what the customer sees and they can hear what the customer hears in that environment. The tool itself is, uh, is, is based on a web RTC, so it's, you don't need to download any application. Uh, it enables uh, various features that you see here on the left hand side, such as taking snapshots, really guiding the customer how to solve the potential problem. As a team, we had for our validation and customer, uh, customer validation period, we had a, a target of 100 pilot customers to prove the value proposition. But as a result of the market, market testing phase, as a result of supporting our customers, we ended up with 3,500 pilot customers and supporting 184 companies in many different uh, regions, including from Australia to South America, to India, to, uh, to the US, and many, many countries in Europe uh, as well. Uh, over 16,000 sessions uh, held. And what's even more important here as well, when we think about the, the social value, the sustainable value, is that by helping solve customers' problems and not necessarily traveling on site, so having a remote by default approach, we're also helping contribute towards saving the CO2 emissions as well. And so the value proposition, we've seen that the, the, the value proposition here focuses on the solution being 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper in comparison to engineers being on site. From an innovation point of view, why is this important? Because we think about field service engineers exist in every part of society in terms of business. And so it's, it's reduction of the service cost. It's a much faster time for fixing. And of course, we want to make sure that we serve the customers and their customers uh, well, so that we improve their customers' uh, experience uh, as well. And so the final part here is uh, the, the vision of uh, augmented vision, the uh, assisted and connected reality and humanizing technologies through new incubations. So culture, as I mentioned, uh, is an area which I'm very passionate about. Uh, and Professor Drucker, you may be aware, uh, famously has said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, and Oksana in her introduction said that I'm also heading up a strategy. But even though in my role, I'm a strong believer that culture definitely eats strategy for breakfast. So from a cultural transformation point of view, uh, we have a, what we call a human centric approach to the culture of innovation. And what this means is that back in 2015, together with the uh, Business Innovation Center, so myself uh, and the team and the European Human Resources Organization, we developed an intrapreneurship program. And the intrapreneurship program was promoting cross-culture, cross-country collaboration, where <clears throat> a number of teams uh, come together, a number of people come together. They work on real business challenges and to solve these by creating a prototype, a proof of concept, a click dummy over a period of six months. And they spend between 10 to 20% of their time uh, on top of, of course, not on top of the work, but on, on top of uh, the innovation program to learn new methods, new skills, uh, and take those learnings back to their different, uh, different business areas where they sit. So the 10 to 20% is agreed with the HR teams, it's agreed with the managers, and it becomes a learning path of development as well. And we were also very fortunate, you see the image uh, at the bottom, uh, that we were awarded the, the President's uh, Award for Global Transformation of Quantum Minolta uh, back in July 2018, to recognize, not to recognize uh, us as the founders, but actually to, to show that innovation exists 
in many different places. What's really important is that innovation is, is essential, but for me, innovators equally are just as important and they exist in every organization. So we've also continued to develop and learn. Um, so last year we had our very first full technology innovation program uh, and we used lots of collaboration tools. We had many learnings and many experiments, uh, but before that we were able to see each other face to face. So on the one hand, uh, I'm very much looking forward to being face to face with, uh, with colleagues once again. On the other hand, it's still very possible if you really push the boundaries to achieve, uh, achieve new goals. Um, and finally, just one part for the technology innovation program. Uh, the way we are scaling the program now is as of this year, we have gone side by side together with our colleagues in Asia Pacific. So we have the program of entrepreneurs in, uh, from India to Australia, to Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, etc. So in summary, uh, the Business Innovation Center is where I sit. Uh, the, the, the responsibilities are end-to-end -end innovation management from a portfolio perspective, where we have skills in scouting, strategy, uh, marketing, service, sales, product development. We focus strongly on the cultural part, uh, which is essential from a human-centered design thinking approach uh, to look for innovators and innovations. And finally, we look at ways of working closely with our customers to build up domain expertise, really think about business innovation rather than technology innovation, although technology, of course, is a strong enabler. Uh, there is more and more of a requirement to develop and create uh, digital solutions, and ultimately to support the corporate vision of digital business transformation. So I hope that's answered some of your questions and given you an insight. Um, so thank you for, for listening to me and I'll, I'll hand back over to uh, Oksana as well. Yeah, Milan, thank you so much for this like immersive presentation because I've heard a lot of insights for myself and you already answered a lot of questions. But I will start with my question. And actually, I will be uh, I will be asking today questions from both, both perspectives. Like, for example, I am a chief innovation officer or a person, a business stakeholder who needs to drive innovation inside the company. And also, I will be asking the questions as a general worker inside a company who wants to be innovative. And I will integrate all our participants' uh, questions, which, by the way, you, dear attendees, already asked us. So, Milan, the first question is the following. How, so you shown this uh, Business Innovation Center in Europe. You also shown that there are several additional innovation centers. So tell us more about the structure, how it works. Do you have a similar vision or you have some specific cultural peculiarities? And also, when you will be talking about that, please start the question of a team. How does it look like and how do you communicate with yeah, great. Uh, very, very good questions as well. Uh, the, the team part, <clears throat> actually, I didn't emphasize enough uh, in the presentation uh, because it's a good point of discussion. Uh, so I'll get to that in a second, Oksana. Uh, but the first part, in terms of the, the overall vision and goal of the, each of the business innovation centers, of course, different regions serve different purposes. Uh, they serve different customers and customers' needs. So whilst we think about scalability, it's really important that we focus on the localized customer needs. So based on development of new products, new services, the ethos is, is the same, but it needs to be localized per region. And then when we start thinking about scalability, there might be some crossover as well. Um, so that's important. Uh, on, the, on the team front, it may sound like we have, we have a huge team, but actually we're a very, very small team of only around 20 people. Uh, but very dynamic. So the skill set uh, in our team uh, is, uh, it's more about the mindset and approach. So we have product managers, uh, we have people from IT backgrounds, uh, we have physicists, actually our director of Europe is a physicist by trade. Uh, we have people, um, we have uh, someone with a PhD in robotics. So it's a blend between uh, someone, uh, people that have worked with startups in the past and corporations, business skills and technology skills as well. Got it. And when you are talking about 20 people, are those 20 people uh, only in your European center or it's around the world? Yeah, uh, only in, in Europe. So yeah. each of the regions has, uh, has around the same uh, number of people. Some maybe a little bit more, some maybe a little bit less. Yeah, got it. 
Do, do you have the same kind of frameworks? And when you are talking about the customers, I would love just to clarify, whom do you mean here like customers? Are those internal departments with whom you are working internally and developing these uh, teams, like innovative teams inside Konica Minolta, or those are external customers and you're building the market knowledge with, with knowing these customers? It's the latter primarily, Oksana. It's, it's our customers uh, that we are facing off to externally. Uh, uh -huh. And the reason for that, if I may as well, is of course, many customers realize uh, that there is more to Konica Minolta mm -hmm. beyond print. But on the other hand, there are customer issues to be solved. And so where we have a potential partnership to solve the problems together by innovating and collaborating together, it, it strengthens our partnerships, of course, but also creating something new. Mm -hmm. And who, who is your main source of information? I would I would I will tell you as a product manager, yeah. So for us product managers, it's definitely customer support, or we are going into the field and doing the customer discovery and customer research, or we are wa watching the analytics and we see that the customers, you know, like have kind of a step which is missed by them or something like this. So what in from your experience in Business Innovation Center Europe, where do you get those insights from? Yeah, uh, another valid, very good valid question. Uh, it, it's a tricky one here because we yeah. all have, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm saying that this is a tricky question and this like relates to the part one of scouting the innovation to my opinion, yeah, because you need to get the market insights, you need to understand what customers potentially would love to solve, you know, like which type of problem. And then you need to understand how this problem uh, is pervasive, whether it's interesting for you and you can grab in the long term some, some business opportunity out of there. It completely answers the question. And I, I, would, I would reflect on a lesson learned actually, um, because when we first established the, the BIC in 2014, we felt very empowered. Right? You know, we're this innovation team, we can go and create the future of our company and we can do everything. It was completely wrong, right? So we, we also want to focus, right? focus is key. So having this portfolio approach, ensuring that there is a clear link towards the overall strategy of the business. And so we head towards the right direction, ensuring that our innovations are customer led meaning, and this is one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in the last 10, 12 years of innovation management. Ask the customer what innovation means to them. Very simple question. How often do we sit there and say, this is innovation, how, look how great we are, because we want to maybe do a sales presentation of some sort. But actually, if you ask the customer, what is innovation to them in their department as an individual, and suddenly you realize, actually, so if that is the definition, what you work in, on de and developing together will be very customer centric. Mm. Do, but, but here are, you know, like the different approach to innovation. So you might have, so there are innovation which are gradual, of course, and you can take it from other industries and you can make it very smooth and it will be kind of a, an incremental improvement in some process. But there are some transformative innovations. So for which in, type of innovations are you looking for and probably how do you select those? What, what is your business opportunities rate in process if you can talk over this? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so there are certain trends that we see, uh, in, for example, automation, is, is a huge trend related to um, Industry 4.0. <clears throat> so we know that traditionally we're also a manufacturing organization. So manufacturing industry is going through a whole evolution of change. Mm -hmm. That includes the sub technologies like a, 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 a IoT, for example, Internet of Things, machine learning, et cetera. So all of the key buzzwords. But what's really important from a scouting point of view is not necessarily focus on incremental innovation because my expectation would be that all companies are, should incrementally be innovating, mm -hmm. but the majority of our customers at Conic and Minolta are small to medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. And so giving structure to innovation, so you know, we have the freedom to think and innovate, but yet still be within boundaries. And one other thing that we are consistently embedding is this design thinking approach mm -hmm. you know, through empathy and through, uh, to, through uh, personas. So what we really need to understand is if these are the type of personas that we want to interview, learn from them. You know, if we have some, some ideas around their pain points, validate those. And it becomes then an iterative experimentative process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And uh, can you can you tell us as an example? So you told uh, us about different examples which you were innovated uh, in and different products.
products, but can you tell about the process itself? So for example, one of the products and how did you come up with this idea? So where did you grab this information? Then how this, you know, like the whole process looked like? You can talk in general just to just to give a sense to, to other representatives of the companies, how the innovation happens actually in a company. Absolutely. Yeah, sure, sure I can as well. Uh, so for, I'll, I'll reflect back on AeriLink. Yeah. The, the last term presentation within the presentation and what we had in mind was service uh, the area of service and support and a lot of strategies for companies are going uh, focusing on first time fix or remote by default so we thought to ourselves okay we can work with our internal service and support division and we collaborated with them to understand what are the customer pain points and then covid arrived and so we, when covid arrived we still have to serve our customers mostly. Traveling was stopped. Our engineers couldn't go on site because of health and well-being. And so we very quickly learned by having a, it was a um, open, we opened up our uh, prototype as an open beta. We invited it and we said, we invited customers to use it for free. <clears throat> so we learned through their use. So we would ask them for feedback, what's working well, what's not working well. And then very quickly through this agile approach, make the changes. Mm -hmm. And that, that process in terms of uh, the stage gate development that I refer to as well, it's a very intense process of developing and creating a business that some of you may be familiar with. But because we were able to very quickly validate that this is a big problem to be solved, even though there were solutions on the market that could serve that need, it wasn't serving the type of need that our customers had. And in different regions. And so what we, what we very clearly saw on these charts uh, from analytics or being data driven, let's say, was where are the new hotspots of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. And we could very quickly then see that the uptake of this solution started to increase. And then it was by this, this nudge theory approach, right? So that people are then embedding the learned behavior. And so by default, it becomes part of the toolbox. So it's not to say this is a great innovative solution. It's actually part of the toolkit as core business. Mm -hmm. And when did, when did you start building a business case for this particular product? So um, why I'm asking so, because in some companies, like a company will give you the initial set of money and other resources just in case you prove that your idea can work. And this is a two-folded process. But in some companies, they have like innovation department, which can try different things and then to create a business case with already tested ideas. So how does it work for you and which approach is better to your opinion? Oh, the, the reason why this was born, uh, the software solution, was actually uh, as a result of another idea we were working on, which stopped. <clears throat> and that idea was a combination of hardware and software. Mm -hmm. so the hardware element uh, came to an end. Uh, and so we said, what can we do with the software solution? Because it's, it was still serving a purpose. And so we focused a lot more on the software development part uh, very, very rapidly. So the idea was there beforehand to serve a different purpose. And then we, we kind of um, cross collaborated with different departments to find a new need, which was there as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you did the product development. You already had the product, you already had an idea, you worked back, backwards to understand, yeah. okay, which type of use cases we can cover with this idea. All right. Correct. Super cool. Super cool. Okay, Milan, thank you so much. Right now, I'm jumping into our participants' questions, and I'm jumping into the other part. Like, what can I do as a as a professional who is working and who wants to have more innovative mindset? So, how to develop, uh, how to strengthen innovative mindset for myself if I'm a worker in a company? I, I, I like this question a lot. Uh, because I had the same question when I started and entered the world of innovation. So my, my background is around management consulting, uh, and then it transferred more into uh, innovation management. I, it, this may sound philosophical, uh, but each one of us has a, has a child within us. And if you remember when we were children, we were asking why, why? And, and if you have families, then your children may be asking exactly the same. That creative essence of children still exists within us. It's only that over time and experience, we've become more closed boxes. So dig deeper to explore that child in you, to ask the question of why. And through that, it leads to creativity. But in terms of the formalities, actually it's for, for let's say education, and uh, I, I'm a strong believer in, uh, in lifelong learning. And I, I also say that at the moment we stand still, we are left behind. So continuous learning around innovation methods, 
uh, referring, for example, I'm, I, I like uh, Strategizer a lot. Strategizer is the company that developed the business model canvas, the value proposition canvas. Uh, so we have integrated that into the way we work. Of course, the I learnings from IDEO around design thinking, data. At the moment, you know, every organization wants to become a data-driven company. Yeah. Uh, and so they have it at a surface level. Now it's the opportunity to learn about these areas. So I would say the innovation mindset is really looking at if you, if you find a problem to be solved, try not to look at it through just one lens, open your eyes and invite other people to collaborate with as well. So dear people who ask this question, you should, you should look at the problem from different angles and there you can find the innovative solution. That's it. Probably you can recommend some books because we have a question in our chat from Oli Lienka and she's asking which book you would recommend to master business innovation mindset. Oh, I have a, actually, I can share with, uh, with you afterwards a, a very long list of books. Uh, but for now, I would say that uh, the first book that comes to mind is uh, Zero to One. Uh, Zero mm -hmm. to One is uh, from Peter Thiel. Uh, and um, the hardest part in innovation is going from zero to one. Well, it is still hard, of course, to, from, from one to N in terms of exponential growth. So zero to one is that thinking of innovation. But to, to then add to that in terms of scalability, I also really like uh, a book from Salim uh, Ismail called Exponential Organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so EXO, <laughs> excuse me, uh, EXO, and Exponential Organizations speaks about 10x. Everything you do, try and think about 10x. If you're saving time in a process, save, it, save the time by 10x. If you're scaling up, think about the 10x level of scalability. Uh, and exponential organization growth. Uh, another book that I like from a strategy and innovation point of view, it's called, uh, I have to remember the right name now, it's called The, the Art of Action. Mm -hmm. And The Art of Action, is, it, it speaks to, to leaders and communities of how to think about actions and results through innovation. Cool. Cool. By the way, Salim has a really interesting, as I remember, either TED talk or he has a talk on Singularity University over this concept. So you can easily see this, this idea. So it's really interesting. And 10x innovation, that's what uh, all the incubators and accelerators in the world are talking because you need to innovate something which is dramatically better in, in some features. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Milan. What to do, how to deal with people who are not ready for innovation. So for example, I'm proposing something super cool and I understand that this will change the company, but my top management doesn't accept that. So how to deal with this type of stakeholder management? Stakeholder management is essential. Uh, and if you're able to help the stakeholder, uh, if you're able to show value to the stakeholder early stage by showing what problem you can help them solve, you would very quickly have them on your side. Mm -hmm. But I, I, uh, in reflection, I would say this is about creating a, a movement, right? So uh, there's, there's a brilliant uh, YouTube video uh, called the, it's a leadership lesson called the shirtless dancer. I know, when he starts dancing and the others are joining him, yeah? I love it. it it's, a, it's a fantastic lesson uh, because that felt like me uh, at the beginning of when I joined the Business Innovation Center uh, to establish us from nothing. And also from Conor Camelotto point of view, because we had to convince stakeholders that we as an innovation team can create value for our end customers, mm -hmm. but also internally. And so when we think about creating a movement, uh, the, the, the reflections that I can share are, so let's say, for example, we have three or four people outside of my team that love innovation, but they sit within the core business. Get them on board, speak, share ideas, understand their feedback, take that on board, get them to then share the idea to their network. So this, this idea of network effects, mm -hmm. it's very, very well, and ideally in a flatter organization. Because ultimately mm -hmm. what happen is you will gain momentum. And when you gain momentum, you begin to have a movement. And so the stakeholder will say, what's going on here? There's something happening. Why do I not know about it? And so when you speak to them, you can say, you can be part of it. And so when a stakeholder one is all you need at the beginning, attaches themselves to your movement, they then attract other stakeholders. Yeah. 
that's as for this technology adoption life cycle first you have your innovators and these like early adopters early majority late majority and laggards and first you need to know with these innovators so that they can give an example to to the others yeah really interesting but um okay okay this is really interesting but how to how to work with business stakeholders and how do you um how do you kind of articulate the business case to business stakeholders? Yeah, what, what are your main points of uh, interest for them, which you are building through your pitch? Because as I understand, you will you, you understand some products, you understand the market need, but what from your experience works best for this type of stakeholders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another very good question as well. I just want to say thank you to Olga, by the way, she asked the question as well, so uh, very welcome. Uh, from a stakeholder point of view, what uh, we've learned is that time is one of the biggest scarcities, and especially of our senior leaders, right? So we think about elevator pitches. I, I know the topic of elevator pitches may have been repeated many, many times in different talks, uh, but the art of elevator pitches is essential. <clears throat> so the, the way that we say, let, uh, imagine uh, your idea on one page and one page of what is your idea in a sentence? What is the value proposition essentially that you're creating through your idea? What is the market need? Have you, have you conducted interviews? Show some data where it's not only a very brief idea that hasn't got structure yet. Go and interview people, build up the data <clears throat> so you can see that there is already some kind of validation. If you can very quickly create some kind of a prototype or even a click dummy, that always works because people a lot of times are visual, right? So especially the visual people, rather than seeing lots of text, can very easily understand the vision through, through animation. Understand the market need, but market growth potential. So we might say big data, huge area. We might say digital transformation, huge growing area. We might say automation, robotics, right? All of these key trends are, are in their process of growing exponentially. So show that this is going to uh, benefit our business. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly they say, right, this is the strategy of Quantum Minolta or your company. This is my idea. And here is us bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. so the final part yeah. of the is creation of new customer value, right? So the, the new customer value, it, it goes beyond, uh, we, customers know us as one brand, but show the added customer value to different departments of the customer's business as well. Definitely. And, you know, like from my experience, we've been working with some very big client and enterprise level. And we also came up with the with a new idea of some process, which is core process for this client and what worked for us the best. And you just mentioned that we did some storyline and we did the presentation in the form of cartoon when this person, like the, the business stakeholder, understood that, yeah, there is a problem. And in this way, it was the best, the best perception, actually, by this person, the whole problem. It's a very good point. Culture, you know, I go back to culture as well, uh, by understanding different cultures in different ways. So when we think about the, the Japanese culture, you know, the, the Japanese presentations are very detailed. <clears throat> the reason being, they like detail as a, as a culture because of the whole education system and other life. When we think about some of my colleagues based in Germany, it, it's very analytical as well as creative. So if you, if you know your audience, you can also adjust your presentations in certain ways. Some people like more words. Um, yeah. I have a feel of the personas that you're presenting to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. And some of the people, for example, in some of the cultures want to have facts first and then the conclusions. And, you know, like some of them vice versa. And by the way, like dear audiences, there was a really interesting article in Harvard Business Review on presentations, and you can read more on that there. But nevertheless, this is not the in scope of our talk, but uh, Milan, we also had a question. So um, like the biggest lessons learned when executing the innovative product strategy. So what should we keep in mind in case we offered this innovative product already? So what to do next and how to execute on this strategy? Mm. So if I understand the question uh, correctly, Oksana, <clears throat> when we think about product and scaling of the product? Yep, yep, the innovating product and then to scale this product and to develop this product. Okay. Uh, so. One other lesson uh, that we've learned is to take the portfolio approach. And so when we think about a portfolio of solutions, there, are, there is the main 
solution or product, and then there'll be sub incubations that follow that specific product. So we might call it a roadmap of development of new features of the main product and then supporting new incubation ideas. So whilst you're scaling the product is of course, ensuring that we have, for example, the market penetration, the type of customers we want to uh, uh, attract, where and how do you want to be found in a digital world? Mm. It's extremely tough, extremely tough, right? So digital marketing sometimes is also underplayed, I would say, uh, <clears throat> because marketing is, is, a, is, a, is a science if, when done correctly. So knowing that you have a good product is not enough. So you have to be found in the right ways. You need to be promoting yourselves in the right places where you have those target personas. So it might be in scientific journals from an academic point of view. It might be, for example, at, um, at talks, or, or it could be when we get back to some kind of new normality of physical shows at the moment, virtual. So really thinking about where and how and who do you want to approach and ensuring that you use the right customer journey experiences uh, to be found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the way, concerning customer journey experiences, we also had the question, what is the best time for building customer journey map and embassy map? Uh, this is a good one as well. So uh, two weeks ago, we kicked off our, uh, our round of a technology innovation program. And so we, we introduced the idea and concept of the design thinking approach. <clears throat> and initially, we encourage everyone to start thinking about the personas. So from a customer empathy point of view, but really understanding who, who, what is this challenge about? And to whom is the pain point concerned? So at the beginning, we think about the customer journey map. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not enough. Of course, it's an iterative process. So once you have a good idea of clarity of thought, that then leads on to, of course, uh, uh, validation of the potential pain points. Yeah, it's really interesting because you need to understand the customer journey map because during this customer journey, you can understand which are the pain points and what are the gains and pains of this person and jobs to be done. And then you can dive deeper into specific part of this journey. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. And empathy, you know, we think about empathy, right? So being persona driven, but the, the empathy maps, uh, I, I encourage everyone to really uh, draft and create the empathy maps because through customer uh, validation or interviews, you very quickly realize that, yes, this is the right assumption or maybe a not. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to hear and to ask you one question, which is actually stated by our, our audience, but I would love to transform it a bit. And the question, like the key question is, what are the methods used to identify such innovations for other use cases? But I would love also to look at this at, from the angle, we have already the technology, as you said, yes, yeah, so as you had. And then how to do it, to how to do this actually product development, because we are not talking about the customer development as in design thinking. In design thinking, you have a customer group, you're doing these interviews, you're diving into details, and then you're building the product. But what to do if we have already the technology and when we need to commercialize it? So what is your approach? Do you do interviews? Do you do A-B testings and you know, like market validation of some landing page or how it, how it looks from, from your side? Yeah, exactly, Oksana. So going back to AeriLink, <clears throat> the, the, soft, the software part, a component was existing. So we said, all right, we have some basis also from, the, from our team that it was developed. So very quickly, we spoke to our service and uh, support division to understand their pain points. <clears throat> so they, they articulated the pain points. And so uh, again, from a landing page, we created a, not such a sophisticated uh, um, website, but it was very simple to understand. And then we said, to the customers and our staff, here is where you can register in two clicks only. So email address, password, sign, and away you go. So within five minutes, you can have your very first session. So simplicity was the key for us as a, as a learning. So at the beginning, we had many, many webinars internally and with the customers. We still continue to. Now we've commercialized the solution. Landing pages, uh, of course, things like security, is you know, security areas are need to be addressed as well. So we, we build trust of safety. So we do security reviews, publish papers formally as well to reassure that the solutions are you know, GDPR compliant. Mm -hmm. So although it sounds like a trivial topic, it's actually a huge topic of making sure that compliance is in place as well. Yeah, we know. <laughs> I think that everyone who is working here with the compliance knows that this is a huge part of work, actually. 
Does that, yeah. uh, does, does that answer the question? Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, that actually answers the question. So uh, I have I have also one more question before closing the part of our our question part. So actually, Milan, what about the culture? So you said that you are working on the process part, but also you are working on the culture. And as I understand, you have this educational program inside the company. But um, how do you envision it in the long term? Because why I'm asking so? Because for example, Google gives this one day in a week when you. You can innovate. Then um, Microsoft at this point of time, they did a very interesting thing. So Satya Nadella, as I remember, he said that everyone is an entrepreneur. So you need to innovate in your specific workplace. And moreover, I've heard from people from Microsoft, it's working like really they, they have these KPIs, etc. So how in Quantica you have it as a more systematic approach in terms of the cultural change, or you envision it as a from bottom to up approach when you can start with some specific cases at the bottom and then you're growing into the up or um, up to bottom approach. How do, how do you envision it in complex? Yeah, and it's reflecting back to the movement that I spoke about, the innovation movement. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right that the, the innovator exists in all of us. But as, as the program of a cultural transformation, so for example, one of my colleagues from Ukraine, uh, Irina was part of the technology innovation program and for her team, they were given a challenge. They worked on developing a prototype, et cetera. They, they won. Uh, and what was really important was what do we think about afterwards? And so a, a reflection point is the end of that journey is, should not be the end of the whole program. Actually, it should be the start of investment thereafter. And so mentally, we have to prepare, of course, for investment, the funds, the sponsorships, so that not all ideas can be built into, uh, into businesses, of course. But there might be some that are maybe the winning, winning ideas that can be implemented by having the right sponsorship in place, by having investment to build beyond the prototype as well. So that's more the kind of, let's say, the bottom up approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the other areas that was beneficial that we see is many of our colleagues then go back to their various countries where they sit and they take those learnings and apply them within their departments. So that creates this institu uh, institutionalized view of uh, innovation methods and approaches. Then we have the top down, but top down is also very hierarchical sometimes, right? It can be seen. We have to go through gates and governance. Uh, but what we need is a fine balance between entrepreneurship and uh, stakeholder led innovations. Mm -hmm. um, one final point, uh, if I may as well, is uh, you know, entrepreneurship, it's, it's great. We can, do, we can work on smaller activities. But if you don't have sponsorship from the highest level possible, then it becomes a, a, a kind of a day-to-day -day activity, you know, localized. So we were very lucky to have the recognition from our CEO, for example, and some of our senior executives from Chronic Minerals Japan that believe in the program. So it's, it's really to make sure that we have tangible outcomes as well as the, the soft human-centered uh, approach as well. Super cool. And, and we have one more question from our participant from Svetoslav. So the question is about people and how well does your organization utilize its people as an asset to help to improve stay competitive and strategic limit goals? And are people used efficiently or it's talent wasted uh, due to lack of effective strategy to your opinion? So what do you think? This organization utilizes its people. I'm just reading it back out again. Uh... Oh, sorry. Do you want me to repeat? Yeah. No, I'm just reading it here in front ah. of me. So I'll, I'll go through um, each of the phases. So how well does our organization utilize its people as an asset to help uh, improve and stay, stay competitive strategic recalls? Uh, yep. So this is, this is the example uh, as well that I mentioned around our technology innovation program is one, but there are lots and lots of other initiatives. Um, so one part of that as well is understanding that people are assets and everyone has something to contribute what might be some of the skills that we don't even know about that exist within our organization. And this often I see in different companies, right, where we have talent, but someone is assigned to a specific role, but they may be able to offer a lot more. Oh. So we may say, for example, uh, I don't know, public, let's say internal public uh, ideation platform where an idea is submitted, having a, a review process, asking experts, but also asking the community is there something you can contribute towards? And through that, you realize that there are there is existing, but plus new knowledge that exists as well. And then the second part of the question, uh, as well as uh, are people used 
uh, efficiently or is talent wasted due to type of yeah uh, sometimes it can be seen that talent could be wasted of course because they're, they're, they're not um, infused enough they're not energized enough so, but it has to be a really fine balance because business exists and we have to serve the customer's needs on the other hand you know where there are innovative ideas then we encourage for them to be shared as well but it's it's really a fine balance between uh, you know, serving the customer's needs and innovating continuously as well mm -hmm. Thank you, Milan. And my last question to you will be a huge one. So the question is the following. What are the key takeaways you can share from your experience with our attendees, but consider in mind, in mind that they can be like CIOs or they are striving to innovate on their products or in their organizations already, but they are not like this business stakeholder level. So what is your top three or top one advice, piece of advice for them? Oh, um, my, my top one, if I had to choose, would be, uh, there's, a, there's a song from the 1980s or 90s, it's, it's called Collaborate and Listen, it has the line in there. So um, I think it was MC Hammer, I believe, something like that. But so, so collaborate and listen. So, and, and the reason why I say this is often we might be shy. And what I'm observing as well a lot is through the virtual communication, uh, there, there are people that are extroverted and introverted. And in this virtual environment, even though the introverted people may be shy maybe to speak, they have valid opinions. Yeah. For well, the collaboration part, if you're stuck at that phase, seek uh, reflection, uh, seek some kind of, uh, not just validation, but you know, we say desirability, feasibility, viability, uh, but within a very small group, ask your friends. And then the listening part is, uh, this is one of the very core Japanese philosophies, right? So we say, you know, listen uh, twice as much as we speak because we have two years and whatnot, right? Yeah. So listen to what people are saying and really drill down. And on that listen part, ask five whys. And when you get to that core, you'll realize that your idea is valid or whether it needs some kind of tweaking as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. Ask for five whys. It's the, my favorite technique because you shouldn't ask all the time why, 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 but in different way. And then you can dive deep to, to the very deep insights for innovation. So Milan, thank you so much for, for sharing with us your piece of knowledge and of wisdom. And I understand that this is kind of a really huge experience and you're doing a great job because I understand what to be an innovative person within the company and you need to, to do something which probably might change the chorus of the company, at least at some point. So I wish you good luck, a lot of energy in that. And for all of you, for all our attendees, I have some piece of information that we will have a podcast in Product Management Community Center with Milan on innovations. So please wait for that one. And this will be like also super amazing at this uh, talk show today. So Milan, thank you. My pleasure. And thank you, uh, Oksana. Thank you, Suplana, as well, for inviting me. I, as I said before, I, I have a closeness to Ukraine, but this is a global audience. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I had a pleasure before visiting, and I, I hope to visit the, the beautiful country of Ukraine once again soon. But, and thank you uh, once again to everyone for, for joining. Yes, thank you for joining, everyone. See you. Thank you so much.